Hey, everyone. Just wanted to kick off this whole discussion about embeddings with the actual tutorial that's directly from Py PyTorch. So I've been focusing a lot on PyTorch recently for some work, um, but it's also something that I think is right at the right speed sort of for us to, uh, to introduce and to talk about. So I, I think these are uh, tools that are directly applicable for many of us in our sort of everyday work environment. So I don't think we have to wait a terribly long time to imagine this is being useful. Now, our example that we're going to be talking about, again, is the the sort of canned embedding example from PyTorch, and we'll get started with that to get a sense of how the code is running, and then we'll keep making iter iterative changes. The goal really is for you to take some time and work on some of the assignments in between. So it, each of the separate videos will have one additional engineering component added. And the goal would be for you to try to do this on your own before you watch the video. Of course, I know that not all of you will do that. Um, but if you really are interested in learning, this is going to be quite crucial. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the actual tutorial. You can you can check it out online. Um, this is the, the spring, early summer of 2022. So things may have changed, but I'll at least preserve the code as it is so you can refer back to it if it's something that you're interested in. And what I want to talk, talk about is um, sort of the way the uh, code is framed and the baseline implementation of how to run with PyTorch. So it's both an example of the, uh, the exact problem that they have. And of course, they're choosing uh, an NLP problem because most of embeddings have been focused on NLP applications. But in my case, I'm actually much more interested in this in, in other cases. So not for NLP. Uh, that's not the main focus of, of my work. So some baselines that we'll get started. Um, we're going to just do a, a baseline import. Um, nothing that's too exciting here. We won't go through every detail, but effectively, you're typically bringing in both you know the full torch library so you can get access to everything internally. Um, and then setting up the neural networks versus functional versus the optimization functions. Again, you don't need to have all of these. You could preserve um, with just the torch and just fill these in with the dot, whatever you need. Um, but this is pretty standard. Now, we're going to be talking about an example that is NLP based, and they're going to be using Shakespeare sonnet, sonnet number two. When they're talking about context size, what we should think about here is the problem, the actual business problem that we're trying to apply is, can you, by knowing the first two words, predict the third word? So in a sequence, in a rolling window that starts at the beginning of uh, the sonnet, if we know the first words, that is when 40, can we predict that the next word that should occur is winters? When we know the words 40 winters, can we predict that the next word should be shall? When we know winters shall, can we predict that the next word should be besieged? And a couple of things we should note. First of all, we can see it's a very small amount of data, right? Our test sentence is just a few lines long. So we know that our algorithm is not going to work particularly well. That's not what we're worried about. We're not worried about its ability to generalize right now. We're just using this as an example of how to work through the sort of mechanics of how um, everything works here. The second point is that we're making an assumption that actually is pretty true in terms of language, which is that context matters. Words that proceed, there is a different definition that follows. So while our example is too small to capture the relationship between two words and the following word, we know that if we were to look over uh, long stretches of the language, English language in this case, we'd see that some words, um, some pairs of words actually do lead into the next word. The second um, variable that we've set really is this embedding dimension. And we're going to talk more about the mechanics in this uh, example rather than the kind of science notion of how many spaces you should embed to. But for the moment, what you should think about is we are going to represent each word in this sentence in a 10-dimensional space. So each word, instead of having a, a value, as though you were doing clustering of like one, two, or six, each uh, word will have 10 dimensions that describe it. So it'll be a vector, or in this case a tensor, of length 10. And that those 10 uh, values will represent the word as it exists. So what we'll do is we'll get these in. And then we'll import our test sentence. And you see, already what we've done is we've split this test sentence up into singular words. Now notice we haven't uh, made anything lowercase. We haven't removed punctuation. If there were numbers, we wouldn't have removed those either. Very simple. And all we're going to do now in this whole little uh, list comprehension is split this example into n-grams, where each word, each example in our list, has two words. When, 40, corresponds to winters. So exactly what I, I framed the problem when we started, the word when and the word 40, can we predict the next word should be winters? And so forth and so on. Oops. 40 winters and the word shall. So again, uh, their example to help 
drive this point home. They print out the first three examples just so that we can see where see where we are. So from my perspective at this point, um, as you're thinking about deep learning, all we've done here is we've just reformatted the problem into effectively a matrix where each entry is the word, a second word, and then a label, which is the word that follows those first two words. So now it's very important at this point for us to start to think about uh, the full space of uh, possibilities that we're working with. So if you've thought about this previously in, in SK Learn, you've been doing more traditional machine learning approaches, you won't often think about the full space of possible results, but we're going to be thinking about the list of all possible vocabulary words that are available. These, in fact, are our labels. So we need to know uh, what all of the labels are. So we can get the list here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a mapping. We're going to create that mapping from the words to the index. And this is something that I've done for a number of years. This was typical uh, pre-Pandas days when you would use a list of columns um, and they would ha you'd have a dictionary and that dictionary would tell you what the name of each column was or a list of rows if your rows had names, same way. In this case, what we're doing is we're assigning a unique value um, to each of the words in our vocabulary. So we have, it looks like around 95, 96 different words in our vocabulary, and each one of them has a different number. And these numbers are going to be important because we can't, we won't feed in to our algorithm uh, the word uh, when, and then the word 40. We'll feed in the numbers, whatever corresponds to when, and whatever corresponds to 40. And then the output will not be uh, the word winters, it will be the word, the number that corresponds to winters. So now we're going to get into the actual model. Um, because we've basically got all of our foundation set up to do the experiment. So what we're going to do here, whenever the classic way that we work with uh, uh, PyTorch is to think about importing this uh, neural uh, net module and then building an instance of that. And really what we're going to do often is overwrite just the core functionality of the initialization and the core functionality of the forward pass. These are really, this is sort of the standard. And in order to get things uh, to work the way that you want, you need to start by establishing uh, in the initialization sort of the known quantities. These are the things uh, that we've tacked down at the front, the vocabulary size, the embedding dimensions, and the context size. Now, what does this tell us? The vocabulary size tells us the set of labels. The embedding size tells us the number of columns. Each word will uh, correspond to a number, a size of an embedding. And the context size will tell us how many words go into that embedding. And so when we look down here, We'll see that the embeddings, we have a, a neural net embedding layer, and then uh, embedding layer will take in the vocabulary size. So each embedding layer will take in the total range of possible words, and it will output the embedding dimensions. Those are the vector, a 10-dimensional vector in our case, 10-dimensional tensor, that represents the word that we're interested in. So if you think about this as a matrix, it's not quite represented that way, but if you think of this as a matrix where each uh, of, the, of the words is its own row, then you have a 96 by 10 embedding dimension. Well, if we have two words, one and two, um, each of which are 10 dimensions, then when we combine them, we need to bring in both the context size, that's the number, how many words, and the embedding dimensions. So one and two words multiplied by 10, of course, is 20. So we're going to take in our first layer of our neural net, we'll take in a 20 dimensional tensor, and convert it into 128 dimensions. This is really important. We're going to take each word embedded in a 10 dimensional space. Then because we're using two words as our context size, we're going to take those two words and concatenate them together, bring them together. And those, those two words that are concatenated together are going to start at 20 dimensions and they're going to move to 128. And then in our particular example, in this, this example, what we're going to do is we're going to take that linear, we're gonna make a second linear layer that takes in that 128 examples and compresses it down to the vocabulary size. Now, it's important that we're compressing to the vocabulary size because we need to choose which of the 96 um, words is the word that's likely to follow. Now, this is just the initialization. No code has been run. No learning has happened. We are setting up the graph that will be executed when we run the code. And the graph that's executed when we run the code is what's embedded in this forward pass. Now the forward pass will take in the inputs. Now the inputs in this case will be one particular example because in this case, we're gonna iterate through the whole data set, not in batches, but in row by row, just for simplicity of engineering. So you can expect that in the future, we'll go and we'll adjust that. So we work chain, convert this to batches. But for this moment, we'll bring in a single row and that single row inputs 
will be pressed through an embedding layer. And you notice this copious uses of views. So one of the hardest things you're going to have to work on when you work in deep learning is getting used to this notion of uh, working with views and changing the structures of, of, your, of your objects as they come in. And we'll come out with an embeds. Now this embeds will be of size context and embedding size. So it'll be these, these 20 this 20 dimensional vector, it'll be pushed through the linear process, this linear model one, and then we'll run it through a ReLU. The output of that will then go into the second layer, goes, comes in at 128, and will come out at vocabulary size. And in case you didn't already, if you couldn't see this coming, because now what we have is an output that's of size 96, we're gonna run that through a softmax. And the softmax is gonna tell us which of the 96 words is the most likely, or the model thinks is the most likely to be predicted and that will return our log probabilities. So this model, very simple, right? It's a two layer neural net. We have a couple of, we have an embedding layer with, with two linear layers, very small, and we can sort of forget about it for the moment. We can set it aside. So now we have our model set up. Now the only question is how do we actually execute that forward pass? Because we might have more complicated logic. In our case, we don't, but we might. We're gonna initialize a set of losses. So we understand how well our model's performing as it goes forward. And in fact, um, yeah, let's finish this. So then we'll also uh, create a, a loss function. We'll take the non-negative log likelihood. And this is um, the loss function that we're gonna use to make sure that our model's moving in the right direction. And then we'll create an instance of our n-gram modeler where we pass it, again, the, the variables that we needed, right? We needed the vocab size. So we've got the length of the vocab, that's 96. The dimensions, the embedding dimensions, which we've defined as 10 up above, and the context size, which again is two, which we've defined above. That's all we have to pass the model. Again, at this stage, the model hasn't been run, no data has been exchanged. We've just initialized the model, we've executed this initialization step, but nothing from the forward pass. And next what we'll do is we're going to set up an optimizer. Again, in this case, they're using stochastic gradient descent. They're passing in the model's parameters into the optimizer uh, with a certain learning rate. So let's just take a moment here and bring this together. Okay, so now we're almost near the end. It's pretty impressive actually that uh, for as complicated as an example we are, we're only at 80 lines of code and that's with uh, the copi copious comments that they make. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do 10 epochs. And the 10 epochs are gonna start, each epoch will start with a total loss of zero because we'd like to chart our loss as it goes over time. And we will take for each of the n-grams, now remember our n-grams were our word pairs, so when and 40 leads to winters but we can't put in when in 40. So what we're going to do is we're going to, for each of these context and target, for each of the context, that would be when and 40, we're going to convert those words to um, their numbers, numerical representation right here. Okay. So we start with when and 40 and then winters. We come down here and we're gonna create a tensor and the tensor is going to take all the words when and 40 and convert them into their index, whatever those numbers are, the two number representation. It's going to pass that in as a list. That list is going to be converted to a, a tensor, a, Py, a PyTorch tensor. We'll have to deal with a lot of stuff like this later. And that will end up with our context indices. We will now zero out the gradient. Now, I'd like to point out that one of the important things here is that we are going to, at each step, zero out the gradient. So there's a bunch of stuff here that you just do time after time, regardless of the context. Um, th these, aren't, these are functions that aren't going to change. This step of converting your raw data into a tensor, you're going to do every time. This step of zeroing your gradient, you're going to do every time. And then what we'll do is we'll pass the value through our model and we'll run this model for the context IDs. So note, uh, this will return us a set of log probabilities. Notice we have not, we have not done anything related to the labels yet. But now we get a list of 96 values that comes out of this model and those 96 values correspond to how much our model thinks each of the following words of the 96 should be the one that's the most important. Now we'd like to see how good a job it did at, at, at sort of making those assessments. So now we have our loss function, of course, which we've defined up here as the non-negative log likelihood. And now for the first time, we'll take those log probabilities and we're gonna pass in these word to index. These are the values that we've just generated from our labels. So now we have a label, it's the next word, winters in this case. We'll convert winters into a number, numeric representation. We'll then calculate the loss function. We'll get the loss. How far away were we from the right answer in terms of our list from the actual answer of what we want? And each of these steps, one, two, three, four, you're going to do every single time. Every model that you run is gonna basically run these. And then the next two you're going to do as well. You're going to then take the loss and back propagate the mistake across the whole data set. So you're gonna back propagate the loss across the model. 
and you're going to run an optimizer step. Now, what's a bit confusing for us is that these effects, they're almost like side effects, they're effects that happen inside the code that aren't directly called. You wouldn't know unless I told you that this step, this lost dot backwards, was going to update the model, but it does. You wouldn't know that this optimizer dot step would have an effect on the whole process, but it does. And that's because uh, PyTorch has worked really hard to abstract away a lot of the complexities and make things a little bit easier. And it's always a debate, right? You have to wrap your head around this and you, it takes time to, to, to understand how things are going to work. Uh, this is probably some of the easier stuff that we'll be talking about, par partially because once you've done this once, this will be copy and paste code that you include every time. Then we'll take our total loss and add it to the loss. So we started our total loss at zero for each epoch. Each time we go through each of the examples, we'll come up with the loss function, we'll keep summing it. And then finally, we'll append this to a losses to calculate what our final results are. So now if we run this, we can look and see what our losses are. And we see our losses are going down. And this is the important point. Your model may be overfitting. Your model, in fact, we know our model will be. But the real question is, is your model learning? So if we'd set this up and we hadn't seen that the losses, uh, 525, 523, 520, are monotonically decreasing, that is for every step we're moving in the right direction, you might wonder if we were actually learning something. If you saw at the beginning that your first loss and your last loss were very much the same, you might wonder a couple of things. One, is your data, does your data have a problem? Or two, do you actually need to go back and double check your code because you've introduced a mistake? Both are possible. And then finally what we'll do, and this is nice, um, embeddings, one of the great values of embeddings is the ability to visualize the representation for each of these words. Now in our example, these words don't have a lot of intuition, um, but in other examples they very much might. And so here, what you can see is that we have the 10-dimensional tensor that describes the word beauty. Again, this is something we can uh, touch on later. The purpose of this right now is to uh, walk through this example and make a decision, uh, sort of understand uh, how the code is actually executing. Now the assignment, the next question for us, is we'd like to move, right now we've, we've got a multi-class classification problem, right? We, we have a situation where we've got a list of 96 values and we'd like to um, only choose, we'd like to choose the value that we think is the most likely to, to follow the first two. So. Um, the next video, what we're going to be thinking about is how we convert this example that we just went through to an example where it's a binary classification problem. That is, suppose you have two words and you'd like to know whether or not those words represent something. We'll be thinking about uh, about insults. So when certain um, you know certain words, certain word pairs are insulting and others are complementary, and we'd like to have, given that you know a collection of words, um, perhaps uh, you know, uh, good job. Good job is a compliment. Um, so if we'd like to classify the words good and job as a complement, we'd use a context size of two, we'd use an embedding space of two, and we'd have a label of one. And what I'd like you to try to do is to try to convert this example into an example where you take two words, one, two, and you have a label. You only have to make five or maybe 10, 15 examples. It's not important how large the, uh, the data set that you work with, because we're not trying to do something that's actually going to work in production. We just want to play with this to see how it works. And I want you to think about what you'd have to change in our code so that instead of having a list of tuples that correspond to a, a new word or 96 values, you just have a list of tuples that are either true or false, binary. And there's a little bit of a hint in there in terms of what you're going to need to change. Uh, give that a go. Tell me what you think. And uh, we'll have a chance to get back together and we'll walk through that change. We'll go through the code one more time and then we'll walk through that change and we can, uh, we can see how, how well you all did. Talk soon.